This is Global Humanist Shop Talk. I'm M.L. Clark. Back in Episode 2, How Countries Make Themselves, I encouraged us to reframe early European colonial expeditions as not much different from the formal corporate charters given to the East and West India trading companies, which would go on to sow oppression and destruction in wide swaths of the world. The legal difference, such as it existed, was superficial. States sanctioned private enterprises which then operated with significant individual impunity sheltered by the broader legal mandate under which all participants operated. At the time, savvy listeners might have wondered if I was talking about state capitalism, a slippery term most often given to countries that run themselves directly as corporations with the government extracting economic value from its citizen workforce were otherwise controlling its range of economic activities through nationalized enterprise. The term can also refer to countries with economies that, while ostensibly private, are still ultimately subject to government intervention and which must adhere to fairly invasive state policies. You can hear the slipperiness in that term though, can't you? Stretched far enough, the idea of state capitalism can be made to include almost every modern government, which is, for the purposes of this series, entirely the point. In part three of his 1880 work, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, Friedrich Engels identified the modern state as precisely that, quote, a capitalist machine, the state of the capitalists, the ideal personification of the total national capital, end quote. But where Engels is especially charming, is that he considered this state of affairs to be a breaking point in human progress. He described this system as one that not only devalues the worker but also makes the bourgeoisie ineffective to the point of irrelevance, a class of people that, quote, has no further social function than that of pocketing dividends, tearing off coupons, and gambling on the stock exchange, where the different capitalists despoil one another of their capital, end quote. He also describes the existence of trusts, wherein, quote, freedom of competition changes into its very opposite, into monopoly, end quote, which he further describes as an exploitation so palpable that it must break down. In other words, he saw this system as so broken that it couldn't possibly go on. And yet, as Engels was writing this work, as discussed in episode 3, Standard Oil was thriving as a monopoly through its Standard Oil Trust, and it would continue to do so until 1911 when the Supreme Court finally intervened. For over 40 years, Standard Oil flourished, and even after, many of its subsidiary parts, ExxonMobil, Chevron, and SoCal especially, would go on to find new ways to dominate in the global petroleum market. So was a breaking point ever inevitable, guaranteed, and sustainable? Or were U.S. citizens just lucky that the Supreme Court ruled in their favor in 1911, and also unlucky that this ruling didn't sufficiently halt a group of corporate entities that would, a century on, come to be named directly in the ruination of our ecosystems? What Engels did not account for in this analysis of the modern state as an exercise in state capitalism was that those useless bourgeoisie would not simply entertain themselves with dividends and stock exchange. They would also take as their rightful playground direct democratic infiltration, the buying and selling of politicians, to continue to bend the rules in their favor for as long as possible. The error lay in seeing business interests as constituent or secondary parts, and not, in fact, flexible extensions of the whole of the governing apparatus. Order in the court! Would today's Supreme Court rule against blatant monopolies like Standard Oil 
that's hard to say. In the fall of 2022, a U.S. District Court judge did find against the merger of two publishing giants, Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster. But in general, U.S. federal courts have been veering toward the protection of corporate interests. In August of 2022, Lee Epstein published a report on Supreme Court rulings from 1920 to 2020 that argued the current SCOTUS is the most pro-business bench the institution has ever seen. And that verdict extends to both the Democratic and Republican nominees on said bench. Nor is this shift entirely surprising because the meaning of a corporation under the law has transformed significantly in recent years. Although corporations were treated in many ways like legal persons in the U.S. after the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868, they didn't gain First Amendment rights until 1978 when SCOTUS ruled that they had the right to spend money on state ballot initiatives. Emphasis on state, not to be conflated with federal elections. That's because in 1907, Congress had passed a law banning corporations from federal election campaigns. But a little over a hundred years later, with Citizens United v. FEC, a five to four decision then ruled that the First Amendment extended to corporations in full, that they had the right to spend money freely and without reserve on every electoral level. Could Engels have anticipated the machine of capitalist enterprise itself becoming an active agent, a mechanical prop that the state would indulge as having full personhood equivalent to, if not greater than, any of its workers and bourgeois beneficiaries? I think not. The utopian component of his socialist revolution relied too heavily on the idea that the machine of state capitalism would have to reach a breaking point. The notion of its persistence, metastasizing and evolving to persevere in new eras, better matches the ideas advanced by one of his contemporaries, Karl Marx, who in an excellent, if lesser read essay, The 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, perfectly illustrated how one era of revolution could easily give birth to the persistence of old social orders under new and more insidious cover. If I'd wanted to, I could have front-loaded this series on petro-nationalism with the wide array of formal theorists who have talked about state capitalism, a term that has been used not only to describe most active and recent communist states, from the Soviet Union to China, but also Germany under the Third Reich, various European states after World War II, and most notably of all, through linguist and historical philosopher Noam Chomsky, the United States of America, on account of its too-big-to-fail management of major players in the private sector. But theorists are often wielded as absolutes, the same as the terms nation-state, nationalism, the corporation. All of it has such a heft of authority that often glosses over the arbitrary nature of our delineations of period and social contract. Today, we're talking about two more arbitrary delineations, capitalism and communism, and the way these references to state practices have overshadowed the very similar imperial expansionist work that many countries in the 20th and 21st centuries have been doing, in strong part to secure access to petroleum and gas products, and with them, the lifestyles and military might that they secure. After all, it's that mental flip, that moment when we better understand how agency can be enhanced or lessened by our policies and cultures, which this humanist podcast always sets out to explore, one everyday object or concept at a time. You're listening to Global Humanist Shop Talk, and for six episodes, we're extracting a deeper understanding of contemporary global politics through a study of petro-nationalism, the formation maintenance and advancement of countries through the oil and gas industries they have created, traded in, and otherwise leveraged for international power at cost to the humans in the mall.
It's a strange business looking at the state of Russia's oil industry today and reading back, not just the country's deep history with petroleum, but even just with the market games it was playing in the lead up to the invasion of Ukraine. The day before the invasion, I published an article on oil imperialism, which explored a story in international petroleum markets from just before the start of the COVID-19 pandemic's mass lockdowns, which involved power play moves between Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the US in relation to oil pricing and production caps. I knew when I first wrote the piece that we were on the verge of an invasion, but I wanted to stress that we had already been at war, an often sidelined but no less vicious war playing out in our global oil economy. So let's go back a ways to the dawn of the second half of the 20th century, the Cold War 50, a series of decades when Western capitalism was supposedly putting up a mighty fight against communism in the form of the dreaded Soviet Union. But let's revisit this critical turning point with petroleum primarily in mind. We're going back specifically to 1948, when US President Harry Truman signed the Marshall Plan into being, a four-year aid and recovery program for 16 European nations. This was a monumental gesture, a little over $13 billion in total. But of course, it wasn't a purely altruistic move, and the US wasn't just giving money to the countries it served. Rather, it created counterpart funds for each of the member nations with strict rules guiding their use to purchase materials often delivered through U.S. networks. In essence, what the U.S. was buying wasn't just restored peacetime Europe, but also increased economic mobility and centrality in the global marketplace. Moreover, each country was required to set aside around 5% of their counterpart funds for U.S. use. Sometimes this involved the U.S. expressly asking the country to fulfill a scarce material need back home. But mostly, it involved setting up CIA operations all across Europe, which in turn prioritized entrenching European resistance to the Eastern Bloc. This is important to keep in mind when talk of the Marshall Plan mentions that the USSR was not interested in supporting the venture. Why on earth? Would it back a campaign of economic infiltration that prioritized U.S. espionage in the region? But another critical component of the Marshall Plan was the $1.2 billion expressly put to use buying crude oil and refined petroleum products from the Middle Eastern industries. By 1950, oil from the region made up 85% of Western European imports, up from 20% before the start of World War II. And by 1952? That number was in the high 90s. Again though, the countries themselves were not directly arranging these trades. Everything was being done through US counterpart funds, and in this way the US had directly involved itself in Middle Eastern petroleum concerns. In his 2023 paper, Suez and the United States, Oil, Lifelines, and All of Mankind, in the Cold War, Christopher R. W. Dietrich pays close attention to the rise of certain rhetoric around the Middle East as the U.S. becomes centrally involved in its petroleum trade through its work with the Marshall Plan. It's during this period that the concept of the world oil market rears its head along with the idea of the free world that is conveniently put in gravest peril by anyone who might want to restrict or renegotiate control over petroleum sales in the region. Indeed, as Dietrich argues, U.S. officials, quote, painted the potential loss of oil in alarmist terms and almost always connected oil supply with the nation's success or failure in the Cold War, end quote. Relatedly, European society was treated as hanging in the balance such that any threat to U.S. dominance in Middle Eastern oil affairs was tantamount to risking the collapse of Europe itself. It's such a clever bit of propaganda that you might have missed the Western gloss it contains, might have skipped over the region itself as a point of human agency to see everything in terms of the U.S. versus Russia. That was, of course, entirely the point. Yes, the U.S. had picked certain regional leaders like Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh as targets for its ire 
And yes, the US and Britain jointly supported a coup to oust this democratically elected politician in 1953 because he called for economic sovereignty and criticized colonial projects like the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, formerly Anglo-Persian Oil from episode three. But they justified this behavior in light of those two aforementioned notions, the idea of a deeper war that needed to be won against the menace of the Soviet Union and its Eastern Bloc communism. And also this utter flattening of a region of richly diverse Middle Eastern peoples to a vague notion of a world market, which conveniently allowed Westerners to treat the region's resources as if they were a global entitlement. If the free world needed this petroleum, well, anyone, even and especially local leaders who stood in the way of the US and Europe, was clearly an enemy of freedom itself. And of course, this rhetoric extended to later crises around the Suez Canal, which in the Middle East was central to local national sovereignty, and which in Western propaganda had become a convenient geopolitical center for its discourse about what really belonged to the world, aka to Britain and the United States. Cutting a path through Egypt, or Misr as it's called in Arabic, from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, this artificial construct built in the mid-19th century offered the shortest maritime route from Asian countries to Europe, and it is still the lifeblood of many modern shipping routes. But the Suez Canal was also very close to the Soviet Union, which made it the perfect place for the US to play out its anxieties of communist forces trying to take over the free world, even though that free world was itself a body of Arab sovereign states around the waterway that wanted very much to be rid of Western interference and the right to develop their own national economies around local oil. In the Suez crisis of 1956, it wasn't communism that halted oil transport along the canal. It was Arab countries protesting Western encroachment on local resources. In the process, ironically, the region's actors also triggered the US's more overt launch into the global oil trade from petroleum in the Americas as it began supplementing losses from the Middle East during these oil blockades. But the half million barrels shipped over from the Gulf of Mexico and Venezuela weren't enough to offset the huge dependency that the US Marshall Plan had created for post-war Western Europe on ongoing access to Middle Eastern oil resources. The US having hung its Cold War propaganda around the idea that the West needed access to oil markets to sustain its freedom and to defend against Soviet advance, now had a significant mandate to continue to involve itself in oil economies in the Middle East as in Latin America. In Western Europe? Well, it had a major quandary on its hands. Still fairly depleted after World War II, was it in its best interest to try to keep hold of its original empires? Or was it wiser to withdraw, conserving resources and giving up old concessions to pave the way for better, more conciliatory relationships with post-colonial powers? As I've noted in a previous episode, Britain certainly chose the latter route, which allowed certain Middle Eastern power brokers to nationalize and rise in sovereign oil market fortunes over the coming decades. But the gap left by Britain retreat did not sit as peaceably with the US amid all its Cold War rhetoric. And as we'll see in episode five, Iraq, Venezuela, Qatar, and Morocco, the US engaged in a fairly brazen set of military campaigns to regain control of petroleum in key Arab states. For now, the crux of our concern settles more widely across the region and returns to this core propagandist belief that the real tension throughout the 20th century was ever really the difference between Western political systems regarded as driven by a sort of free market capitalism and Soviet systems, which were in contrast labeled as an alien and oppressive communism hostile to the idea of a free world or global marketplace. 
in the Middle East, spanning from African to East Asian nations fortunate or unfortunate enough to have struck upon significant petroleum reserves, this whole Western conceit of a war centrally between capitalism and communism routinely, for decades, glossed over the much more coherently localized ambitions of Arab peoples to decide their own futures and to reclaim land that had been given by past rulers illegal concessions of up to 75 years to foreign corporations for oil. The entire time that folks in the West spoke grandly about self-determination, freedom and liberty, these were precisely the principles that Western corporations felt were threatened by local political discourse. And in response, Western states, the U.S. especially, sought to reframe the Middle East in the mid-century as a stand-in for relationships between the East and the West. Its own sovereignty was very much secondary to broader power plays. Today, Russia's war in Ukraine echoes some of the lessons that went unlearned in the middle of the 20th century, not least of which being the danger of over-reliance on a single external region for one's energy resources. But in the interim, the U.S. continued to define itself and to moralize around its global petro-nationalist enterprises. The idea of the 20th century being shaped by a war between Western capitalism and Eastern communism therefore abides in most standard history curriculums, even though there's very little about the Western governance structure, especially around its use of private state-sanctioned oil corporations to advance political power plays in far-off regions that cleanly delineates it from the kind of top-down, government-driven economies more often treated by Western scholars as truly communist states. Are there differences between petro-nationalist states? Absolutely. And in the next episode, we'll use four national histories under petroleum to highlight the different outcomes possible for states driven by this industrial enterprise. But even then, I encourage us all to look closer at what undergirds all these varying state fortunes because what it all amounts to is a very different story than the one we've been given about our social contracts. And until we reckon with the real driving forces of contemporary political inequity, there's very little hope of undoing, even a little, of the immense damage that these last two centuries have done. This has been Global Humanist Shop Talk with M.L. Clark. Maurizio Ferraz is my one-man dream team of an audio production specialist. Studio space and resources were provided by Agencia El Grifo, and all further credits for cited and referenced content can be found in attached episode notes. All of this would not have been possible without my patrons, the vast majority of whom support me through Patreon. You can also follow my work at Better Worlds Theory, a weekly newsletter at mlclark.substack.com. None of us excels without the support of a community, and I am deeply thankful to have found mine. Be well, be kind, and seek justice where you can. <laughs>